Okay, in this video, we are going to talk about this great book, The Difficult Doctrine of the Love of God. Now, if you're like me, you hear that title, and you're like, why? Like, why is the love of God difficult? I thought that's one of the easy ones, right? Maybe God's holiness or God's wrath, or maybe those doctrines are difficult, but why the love of God? So, so today I am going to just show you a little bit, give a glimpse of what this book means when it says that the love of God is difficult, and I hope you would agree by the end of this video. And if you're new here, this is uh, our channel name is Books of the Wise. We we tackle books like this. We give you the best insights of the great Christian books. And so if that's something that you'd be interested in, remember to subscribe to this channel. You can be notified as well. So, so let me just share one big correction that DA Caution gives us, but then also um, how the scriptures speak of the love of God. So the first correction that um, DA Caution gives in this book is the very common idea of the different Greek words to describe love. And Christians base their whole theology on the definition of the word. So very so just for example, you probably would know this, uh, the Greek word eros refers to sexual love, while the Greek word philio refers to friendship or even, even like an emotional kind of love. And then the word, here's the word, the word agape, right? That word means unconditional love or love that is sacrificial or to will the good of the other despite the way you feel. Now, there's a lot of, I mean, it's valuable to think of love in that way. But when you come to the Bible, it really just doesn't fit well. So the first caution that uh, D.A. Caution gives us, that's really what we call an exegetical fallacy, is to base our whole study on a linguistic definition of the word without looking at what that word means in context. So to give give like just a few examples in the Bible, the first example comes from 2 Samuel 13, verse 1. Now remember, the this is Old Testament, was written in Hebrew, but remember, the Old Testament was written in Hebrew, but remember that there was a Greek translation of that, and these people were fearful of God, they loved God, um, and so the claim is made that even these translators introduced the word agape to communicate uh, a different category of love. But here we have an interesting example. Uh, this is uh, 2 Samuel 13, 1. Now Absalom, David's son, had a beautiful sister whose name was Tamar. And after a time, Amnon, David's son, loved her. Now if you look at here, this is the, the word agape. So this, David's son loved him his sister, but if you read the rest of the story, what happened? He raped her. So we will hardly say that this is that self-sacrificing uh, agape love of unconditional love like God, right? A second example comes from the New Testament. Um, so you might say, yes, but that's the Old Testament, so this doesn't apply really. But um, in the New Testament, it seems like the word phileo and the word agape is used interchangeably. Uh, it's hard to distinguish a uh, a distinction between these two. For example, John 3, 35, the father loves the son and has given all things into his hand. So here we have the word agape. The father loves his son. But um, in the same gospel, John 5, verse 20, we have a similar statement. But this time it says, the father loves the son and shows him all that he himself is doing. Here, the father, phileo, phileo, the son. So, it's hard to really see a very big distinction between agape and phileo in this context. And then just another, another last example is 2 Timothy 4 verse 10. For Demas, in love with this present world, has deserted me. Now, here Demas says to, is said to love the world. Now, guess what word that is? Agape. Now, if agape means... Um, self-sacrificial love, unselfish love, you know, to just love other people without thinking of yourself, then this verse doesn't make sense. Demas deserted Paul because he agape the world. He loved the world. So it cannot mean uh, unselfish, sacrificial love. He's sacrificing Paul for the world. So, so, all, all that uh, D.A. Carson is saying is we shouldn't base our theology of love on just a word or the word's meaning. That's a, that's a mistake. 
Rather, you should do your theology or your study of the love of God like you do any other study of the doctrine of God. Texts in context. So you look at what, how does the Bible describe God's love um, in different settings? Um, so we take the word and we put it in context. Okay, so, so I hope that's helpful. That, that has been a good correction for me um, to see. Now, Carson says that, or shows us, that the Bible at least shows five different aspects of God's love. And this is already why it's becoming a difficult doctrine. It's not just like this one aspect of God's love and that's it. The Bible shows there's different ways God loves us, his creation, and therefore we have to be careful. We have to think carefully about the love of God. So the first aspect of the love of God is God's peculiar love for his son. Or to say, the peculiar love of the Father for the Son. Twice in the Gospel of John, we said we, are, we, we, we see that the Father loves the Son. This is an intra-Trinitarian love. And that's really the basis of why God does everything. He created the world for himself. Like Colossians 1 says, all things were created through Christ and for Christ. So that is what all of creation um, exists. So without understanding this intra-Trinitarian love, you don't understand God's love at all. Secondly, a second aspect of God's love is God's providential love for all of his creation. And here, when we say uh, his creation, we, we literally think birds, trees, animals, everything. Uh, Jesus shows us in Matthew 6 that the Father clothes the grass and he feeds the birds. In Matthew 10, 29, it says, not even a bird falls to the ground apart from your father. God is intimately involved with his entire creation. That's goodness. That's God's love displayed. Third aspect of God's love is God's salvific stance towards his fallen creation. Now, here we have those famous verses, right? That God has a love for all people, believer, unbeliever alike. John three sixteen for God so loved the world. Now, some might take the word world here to say the elect or the those who are chosen by God, but I think that's an overreach. I don't think that's the idea here because of, um, for example, in 1 John 2, verse 2, it says, Jesus, not just the propitiation for our sins, but also for the sins of the whole world. So I think there the idea is all people, not just for the elect. Now, true that in John, the word world doesn't so much refer to the bigness as to the badness of the, of the people. So we should really take away from this verse that says, wow, God's love for people like this, right? Bad people. But I don't think it excludes also the whole world, all people. And you see that in God's heart. You see that God's heart um, displayed, for example, in a passage like Ezekiel 33 verse 11 that talks about, God finding no pleasure in the death of the wicked. One, and 1 Timothy 2 verse 4, that says, God desires all men to be saved. So this is God's invitation to all the world. He commands all people everywhere to repent and to come to Christ, to trust in him. And this love is for all. But this is, leads us to the fourth aspect of God's love. There is a particular selective effective love for his elect. And um, the famous, uh, so there's an Old Testament example, and then obviously a many New Testament, but Deuteronomy 7 verse 7, uh, God says, it was not because you were more in number than any other people uh, uh, that the Lord set his love on you and chose you, for you were the fewest of all peoples, but it is because the Lord loves you and is keeping the earth that he swore to your fathers that the Lord has brought you out with a mighty hand and redeemed you from the house of slavery, from the hand of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. So God says, I love you, not because you were better or more in number. I loved you unconditionally. I chose you. I loved you because I loved you. It's not because you were a great nation or I could see in the future how you are going to love me back. No, this is a selective love. And this love, by definition, was not given to all people. It was given only to Israel. And so this is a selective love. This is an effectual love. When God has set his love on, on the people of Israel, they, they were his people. He brought them out of Egypt. In the New Testament, you find the same concept. In him, um, 
even before the foundation of the world, God chose us in Christ. Um, and one, Second Thessalonians 3 talks about God chose us as first fruits to be saved. Um, I think that's 3 verse 16 or something. Um, I'll probably put the correction, the correct verse up here or here. <laughs> um, and then Ephesians 5.25, husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church. There's a special love Jesus has for his bride that he doesn't share with all people. And just like you won't accuse me of being unloving if I say to you, I love my wife more than all the women in the world, right? There's, there's something unique to that love. I love all women appropriately as my sisters and image bearers of God. But when it comes to my wife, um, she is my bride. I, I, I have covenanted myself with her, not with all people. In the same way, the Lord Jesus hasn't covenant, covenanted himself with all people, but with his people, his church, the elect. Um, so there is that particular love that God gives to some, but not to all. And then the last aspect of God's love is God's love towards his people in a conditional way. Now, this was one of those surprising things for me when I was like, but I thought God's love is unconditional. But yet there are scripture verses like Jude 1 verse 21. Keep yourselves in the love of God. So that's a command you have to do. And if you don't do that, you are outside of the love of God. So this love of God, speaking in this verse, is dependent on your obedience. Another famous example is John 15. John 15, um, I think it's saying exactly the same thing. Uh, 15 verse 9. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love. So if we disobey Jesus, if we don't keep his commandments, we are not abiding in the love of Christ for us. So now just to give an illustration, I think the best way to understand this is a way a parent loves, loves their children. I, I hope that if I discipline my children, they know that even the discipline is out of my love for them, Yet they, they're not really remaining in my love by disobeying me. I want to bring them back to my love, to, my, to, the, ex, to the experience of my love. And I think that's the same way with us and the Lord. There's a relational aspect of our love for God and love, God's love for us and our love for him that we cannot experience if we are constantly sinning, constantly disobeying. We need to remain in the love of God by obeying the word. Now, I hope you can see just by those uh, brief outlines of different ways God loves this is not a simple doctrine. This is a difficult doctrine. And there, even in these five aspects, there's things we need to take into account and think rightly. Now, if you'd like, like me to go a little bit deeper into some of those cliches or some of those uh, five aspects of the love of God, um, then please let me know um, because there's so much more in this book that we could look at. But I thought for this first video, maybe the last video, on this topic just to show you how good this book is. And I think it's a great book for Christians to think rightly. So if you'd like to buy the book, there will be a link in the description box below. So please check that out if you'd like to invest in your knowledge of the love of God for more. And um, remember to like and subscribe to this video for more. And until next time, God bless.